Greetings everyone and welcome to the end of the beginning. Listen to our fable of the Bionicle. Bionicle is my favorite LEGO theme. Chima is my favorite system theme. But Bionicle is my favorite thing LEGO's ever put out. I was there to witness the violent explosion of its birth and I've watched it die twice. Over the last half dozen or so episodes, I've gotten messages from people sad that it didn't look like I'd get around to it. But come on. Bionicle isn't just another theme. I couldn't plop it in the middle of a LEGO retrospective and wrap it up in 11 minutes. I had to save it for last, make this an event. I wasn't going to cover Bionicle when I started Rewind, but plans change. I made this episode like any other, just as much for people learning about Bionicle now as it is for longtime fans. So I'm not gonna cover every side story, every character, every bit of post-mortem trivia. So sorry if a few things you want to see mentioned get left out. I'll focus on what it was like growing up with this theme that grew up with me, the changing mood of each year, and paint as simple and cohesive of a picture as I can. And it's still an hour long. Let's do this. <clears throat> I broke a socket. Bionicle was a constructible action figure line, construction for short, released to test markets in December 2000 followed by a full release in 2001. Originally conceptualized as do heads to be just another of many cheap action figure lines LEGO threw away after one year, it shared many molds with slicers and robo riders. Really just an next iteration of those. It's hard to imagine a world where Bionicle concluded in 2001, but that was the plan. Until then, most LEGO lines didn't really have stories. They were a springboard, the beginning of a story, left open for you to fill the gaps. But LEGO wanted something more forward-looking this time, a proper storyline with structure and drama and continuity. Their Star Wars sets were successful, but that license wasn't paying for itself fast enough, so they looked inward for ideas. Some voices saw the potential in Bionicle and urged LEGO not to waste it, to have a whole roadmap of future stories ready for potentially decades. Kinda funny how it looks like a face. Huh. Like a Big Bang, Bionicle was a success, a combination of good marketing, super affordable products, and a deeply engaging world. The story is actually pretty simple. In the time before time, the great spirit descended from the heavens, creating an island paradise, which his children named Matanui after the spirit himself. Matanui's evil brother Makuta coveted the people's fealty, demanding to be worshipped and striking Matanui down in anger with a cursed slumber. The people turned their gaze towards the heavens, awaiting the arrival of six heroes who would free the island from Makuta's shadow and restore the great spirit. Alright, alright, that's enough to go by, but it's clearly not the whole story, and leaves us a bit of room like any good old LEGO theme does. The whole world was just so mysterious, and that name, Bionicle. A perfect blend of science and fantasy. It sounds like it could mean anything. I'll tell you what it means later. I still get annoyed when people call these Bionicles, cause that's not what they are, but I still say LEGO so I don't have much of a leg to stand on. Here you had these mechanical looking beings you'd expect to live on some robot planet like Cybertron, but here they were on a tropical island setting, with very limited technology, living like tribesmen. Wielding elemental powers like fire and water, wearing masks that gave them other abilities, and they had real names, like Tahu and Kopaka, lifted from various real world languages. As we'd soon learn, they weren't even robots. Despite appearances, they were alive, with organs and chunks of muscle holding their metal frames together. They were people in almost every sense of the word. They could drown. They could eat. Differently than us, but just imagine this guy with all the gaps filled in, like an inside-out Terminator. The Toa show up in shambles because they were in those pods for so long, all their flesh died and rotted away. It took some time to grow back once they put themselves together. It was contradiction on top of contradiction, a bizarre marriage of tropes and aesthetics that, on paper, should alienate everyone. But alien as it may be, this world was unique and the characters themselves oddly endearing. They were clunky like clumsy metal children. There was nothing else like it. All released around the same time, you had the warriors, Toa, the villagers, Matoran, their chieftains, Turaga, and the animals. Rahi that range from enemies to harmless fauna fleshing out the world even more. And they all had collectible masks, even the beasts, the goal being to unmask your opponent and weaken them. They were planned to knock each other's heads off, but that was too violent, so masks it is. This line-wide consistency made Bionicle a nice orderly sandbox, everything you needed to tell a story all prepared for you just like that. Well, 
except for Makuta, the biggest bad of all. He didn't get a toy for a few years, though the shapeshifter did appear in lore as a villager and a swirling mass of bionicle pieces. People can call that a cop-out, but I think it made Makuta scarier. He wasn't just another mook you could knock over, he was unknowable, something beyond us, and they did well building him up in those earlier years. He was a force of nature, the true master of the island, nudging our heroes in exactly the direction he wanted them to go. This mystique was mostly thanks to the Ma'anui Online game created by Templar Studios, released in chapters throughout the first year. There was going to be another game, a CD-ROM release called The Legend of Matanui, which features many of the same side characters and centers on the Toa. But this game was cancelled. I remember seeing it advertised on other little CDs packaged with the Toa themselves. Say what you will about this theme, but it had atmosphere to spare from day one. Get a load of this sound design. It was strange but inviting, a right and proper alien world. For a while, I didn't even know the game was cancelled. I just kept wondering, where is it? The Ma'anui Online game, which focused on one of the villagers, had to pull that other game's weight and set the tone for the entire enterprise. See, as relatively simple as Bionicles started out, there was no one place you could get the full story. There is a website with everything lovingly compiled by fans, the Biomedia Project, but that media was split across numerous formats. There were parts of the story that the games left out, that the comics left out, and then there were novels, movies, online serials, all of which had their own pieces of an incomplete puzzle, so no matter which version of Bionicle was your favorite, you were always missing out on something. But Templar Studios managed to tie it all together commendably for a time, providing us insight into the lives of the island's denizens, and of course giving us a colorful backdrop to insert our toys into. And I cannot stress enough how important the accessibility of this line was. Seven dollars per toa, packaged in the same pill-shaped canisters that delivered them to the island, with rustic metallic hues, slick graphics, character art that just glowed on store shelves. It screamed, join me on an adventure. Adventure. And sure, $7 in 2001 is 10 of today's dollars, but that's still super affordable. You could get the whole team in a matter of weeks with a decent allowance, and despite their smallness and fairly low piece count, even the Toa had good Technic Engineering built in, like the Slicers, except this actually does something, and the animals had more complex functions and came in pairs, so you didn't even need a Toa to roleplay with a friend. I like how they're all black and gray with one accent color, it feels like, yeah, they're all part of the same ecosystem. The Bionicle comics became a staple of the theme and of LEGO Magazine making it one of the most widely distributed comics in the era. I love the early artwork. All the scratches and dirt on the characters really make them part of the setting. These releases, combined with a wealth of readily available online content and exciting lore, made a near-perfect launch for back then. I remember first seeing the Toe in person. Kids test playing with them on a table at Toys R Us, that didn't happen often in my area. The first I got was Gally, Toe of Water, and my brother got Kopaka, Toe of Ice. I didn't even know Gally was a girl, that was interesting. Although it is annoying that all the Blue Islanders are girls and there aren't any in the other tribes. That's stupid. First day I got her, I dropped Gally two stories, breaking off one of her hooks with a nub still inside her wrist. I was morose. One thing I appreciate about the Toa this early on is Lego did try to give them some individuality. With the arms and legs switched around, different eye colors, different shoulder widths or heights, it was a commendable effort given the very small range of molds to pick from in this still developing form of building, and the loads of combiner models encouraged us to mess around with the system. But being autistic, I tend to just build them, take them apart, and rebuild them dozens of times. All in all, solid first year. 2002, things got more serious. Returning to the surface after facing Makua the first time, the Toa find their villages menaced by swarms of truly robotic Borok. These continued the awesome marketing, the canisters this time stacking together like a beehive, with a dormant Borok sleeping inside. You wake one, you wake them all. They have one mission, to clean everything. It must be clean, and if you get in their way, they'll just recruit you into their ranks with mind-controlling parasites. They have no ill will towards the villagers, but Matanui apparently can't wake up with all these huts and temples and monuments in the way. No, it's all gotta go. The whole island's gotta be swept clean. Problem is, people were still living there at the time. These curious monsters shared similar colors, names, and abilities with the Toa, like a distorted mirror version of them, which fits because they're actually another part of Matanui's sleep cycle, like a different type of blood cell, very much a part of the same system as the Toa. They're not enemies. The queens of the hive mind even called the Toa their brothers, and don't understand why they interfere with this very necessary 
necessary process. It just wasn't time for them to wake up. So the people postponed Armageddon, arming themselves with mechs built from destroyed Borok parts while the Toa ventured into the hive with suits of their own to confront the queens. This year showed us more of the secrets lurking beneath the island, but that only left us asking more questions. Who built this architecture? What was this whole army doing stored here? What is this island really? It definitely helped that the animators at Templar continue releasing content with the same style, characters, locations, and atmosphere of the online game. That consistency really built Bionicle's first years for people. The Borok War ended with the Toa dunked and energized Protodermis, an unstable liquid version of the mineral their bodies are all made of. The substance transformed them into Toa Nuva, a slick upgraded mutant version with stronger armor, amplified elemental powers, and masks that could shield or strengthen the entire team, not just the wear. But even these powers didn't compare to the elite Borok Hal's new abilities and increased intelligence, and yeah, it's the first two years of toys repeated. The Toa at least got new limbs, armor, masks, and weapons that doubled as skis, flippers, a friggin' lava surfboard. They do feel like a substantial upgrade from what came before, as much as their previous selves were from other lines. But the Borak Hell really were just the same sets with some silver thrown in. It's pretty shameless. This often forgotten part of the story was interesting though, as the Toa finally faced opponents on their level. Not mindless troops or brainwashed animals, but a squad of six that could counter everything they did and were smart smarter than them. They were the toughest of white blood cells, stealing the Toa's powers and leaving them helpless. The Toa once again prevailed, but this chapter almost feels like an afterthought. Not the proper conclusion to a trilogy. Come on, this is getting repetitive. What's next? Turns out, the end times. Makuta was out of options. Controlling the island's wildlife and waking up the Borokan worked, so he pulled out his trump card. The demonic Rakshi, his children. And these really were the next level. They were dreadful, with their giant feet, lanky legs, lizardly features, inner slug pilots, their knees. But the staffs gave them a more elegant air. A grim reaper vibe, like they were part of a higher purpose. And they did more damage to the island than the Borok ever could. As we saw in the first Bionicle movie, Mask of Light. Just the fact that we were getting a Bionicle movie was crazy. Kids growing up today might be accustomed to LEGO's anime releases, but this output just wasn't feasible in 2003. The animation was too expensive, we were lucky to get anything. LEGO had never done anything this big before, and Bionicle, of all lines, got the first honor. Jackstone doesn't count! There were plans to release a Bionicle movie sooner, but those fell through. The line still needed to prove itself, but by now it certainly had. No sugarcoating it, 2003 was probably LEGO's worst year. They almost went bankrupt, but Bionicle kept going strong, experiencing one of its best years. Makuta finally had a figure of his own, but perhaps more importantly, so did Takua, the chronicler, the hero. Takua was us. The fans following the Toa on their journey, recording their adventures. The eyes we saw this whole world through since the online game, since earlier than that. A meek but brave villager, never content to stay still, always driven by destiny. Takua was a diamond, the closest thing we had to a proper protagonist, probably the most beloved character in the franchise, and this was his movie. We got to hear him speak. Of course! It's what the audience came for! We got to hear the Toa speak. Uh, Toa Tahu! Chronicler! Sightseeing, were ya? Tahu was voiced by Scott freaking McNeil. You worry about scratches. My village is gone. The movie itself isn't that great. I think it might be the weakest of the original three, but it does well showing us the island in a light we never imagined. The whole thing feels apocalyptic. It's overwhelming to see the Rakshi destroy village after village after village like it ain't no thing. Nothing could stop them until the Toa came together, with Takua finding his place among them, now rechristened Takanuva, Toa of Light. That blew my mind as a kid, and Ligas reused this trope in lines like Ninjago and Chima, trying to recapture that magic. On a side note, there were rumors of a seventh Toa in earlier years, a purple Toa of electricity named Variki. Yeah, a Photoshop job like this wouldn't fool anyone nowadays. Well, maybe some people. I know some don't like the models in this movie or the masks moving like real mouths because it isn't set accurate. Personally, I appreciate these characters represented as the living beings they are. You can see their flesh in the folds and cracks of their armor. This is how they would look if they were real, though I think they capture the balance between the biological and mechanical much more smoothly in the next movie's characters. The toys just couldn't convey this aspect of the story. You had to imagine it. So yeah, the island's wrecked. There's no recovering from this. The Matoran way of life was over. As we knew it anyway. Right from the beginning, there'd been subtle hints that the Matoran didn't always live here. What little rundown technology they had or understood seemed repurposed from other more advanced tech. Something happened. As we'd soon learn, the chieftains had never told us the full story. The island had been good to them, but it was time the people returned to their true home.
Welcome to Metronui, a city coincidentally shaped just like the island and a fraction of the size. Curious. 2004 took us back a thousand years to the peak of Matoran society. We had a new team of Toa to collect, and Liko's handling of this was so smart. The reveal that Matoran could become Toa opened a new can of worms, and we learned this year that Toa could become Turaga. Those chiefs, what originally appeared to be three different species living together were actually the same species, just different stages of the Matoran life cycle, and this flashback showed us the chiefs in their prime. Again, so smart. They could have just said, oh, don't worry, kids, these are still the same heroes you know, it's just Tahu and the others got upgraded again. Or thrown us a group of completely new characters we knew nothing about, but they lifted other familiar faces from the lore to show us a new side of them, to make them more interesting, familiar but not pandering. That's a good compromise if I ever saw one. Metro Nui changed the game. It made the Bionicle universe bigger, altered our understanding of it, but not too much. There was still a lot of mystery. The place was industrious, but had this mythical, spiritual vibe to it, like Mount Olympus or Valhalla. But this pristine, gleaming city had a seedy underbelly. Matoran were being disappeared. The previous iteration of Toa nearly wiped out, and a giant plant creature seemed to be the new villain, but was really just a red herring in those first few months. You know how the Slicers and Robo Riders always had some environmental monster attack them from the background? Not other sets, just play enemies you had to imagine? I think this was the last time they did that. It turned out Makuta was behind the city's corruption, branding our new heroes traitors to the state and sicking law enforcement on them. Yeah, Metro Nui is cops, and they they are completely unfeeling drones with no oversight. This commercial's great. The way each one's movement flows to the next to the next really illustrates that the Toa were facing one giant enemy this time. Bionicle commercials are art. The toy's aesthetic drastically changed. The colors were darker, slightly more muted, and gave these Toa a slick metropolitan feel, incredibly distinct for the time. They're probably the most beautiful Toa I've ever looked, but the builds were different too. The Toa Metro still had the same gear function as other Toa, but cleaned it up. As much as I like the old Toa, the lack of elbows and knees and necks is annoying, and it wouldn't have taken much to afford them those simple luxuries. The Rakshi raised the bar for these more refined Toa, and these still hold up pretty well. The Matoran were slick too, taller and healthier looking than they'd be in the future. This was the last time we'd ever see those older style masks and heads used for figures. It was also the last time we'd see those discs, a hallmark of the 90s and the birth of construction. The big gimmick of those early figures was their ability to throw the discs with a springy arm, and this carried over to Bionicle with the first Matoran. 2004 brought the discs back in spades. The Matoran carried heavy-duty launchers, Vakamas was even better. The villains shot discs from their mouths. It's things like that and the final Templar animations that make 2004 feel like the true end of that first era of Bionicle to me. This year's movie, Bionicle 2, was the best of them all, I think. The story is concise, the character's not the usual Toa, and is probably the most emotional Bionicle production. While Mask of Light's Apocalypse was more bombastic and explosive, this is just somber. We witnessed an entire culture dying. The people survived, more or less, their bodies diminished and memories erased, but they lost everything. We see a people who once had ivory towers and airships the size of football stadiums reduced to almost nothing. We see the moment Makuta put Matanui to sleep, the day a thousand years of unrelenting hardship began for these humbled people, destroyed by someone created to protect them. And again, the sound design really drives us home. Makuta's curse had already been affecting the big guy for a few centuries. By the time this generation of heroes was summoned, it was too late. They were never going to save the city, but their job wasn't to protect a few buildings. Their job was to get those people off that sinking ship. Makuta took everything from them, but they won by surviving. Lego doesn't do stories like this. This is incredible. Four years in, Bionicle had become so much more than anyone could have expected. But this is where the honeymoon phase ends. Bionicle would continue to be great for years, but it was a different beast. It became less innocent, only growing more violent and edgy with each year, until you had characters with gore in their name expressing how much they love cutting people open and wearing their dripping guts like a scarf. Today's letter is V for vivisection. I'm exaggerating slightly. It wasn't like anyone would just be dismembered at any moment. More like a guy might hit you with a mind control sphere and tell you to walk into lava. Just to hear the amusing pop of your sizzling flesh. Or a guy made of microscopic bugs might stab you in the torso with his giant golden triple prunk scissor blade, partially disassemble inside you, and let the little guy start gnawing on your organs. 2006 was hardcore. 2005 was still alright. Throw yourselves off the edge. 
funny enough, this whole year completely phoned in. Metro Nui's story was over. 2004 had a beginning, middle, and end that wrapped up perfectly. But um, see they made a lot of assets for this place. A lot. And wanted us to look at those backgrounds a little longer. So a second year was tacked on. Another in-between story like the Borak Cow. After bringing some of the captive Mator into the island, the Toa Metro returned to rescue the rest and find the city overrun by giant spiders, which immediately overwhelm and mutate them into horrible half-Toa half-beasts, of course. Interestingly, you can recreate those fears with two Toa Metro canister lids. The marketing continued to be solid. The city was a husk, all its splendor and meaning gone, and our heroes were ruined. The toys were okay. The spiders themselves were pretty neat, but the Toa Hordika were more of a novelty. These would be the last figures to include gears for some time, and it was all dumped into one giant arm. If these were your first taste of Bionicle, I wouldn't blame you for dismissing the whole line. They look cool enough, but being ugly on purpose doesn't save them. And they really were clones at this point, only the masks and weapons to set them apart. And the collectibles were weak. In previous years, we'd had masks, not masks, and discs. This time we got spinners that really felt like a formality. The third movie is another very somber piece. What's happened to me? Bitter even. You saying that smelt head? What's the matter? Too busy cooking up another master plan? I'm through making plans. Well, that's the first good thing I've heard since I've been hideous. I'm sorry I let you all down again. <laughs> The moodiness does get a little grating, but the end actually wraps up very poignantly. Sure, we get a giant battle with a spider army, but there's a smaller, more intimate battle for the soul of Metro Nui, its people, the future, what it represents. It just makes me sad, like, if these heroes failed here, nobody would know. The Bionicle story would end before it ever began. It was their darkest hour in the movies, and composer Nathan First music just reaches a whole new level here. I don't believe that coming from you! Wait! Not for long. I'm sorry for doubting you. Our strength comes from our unity, Makama. Which means you can't be strong without us. I'm better and stronger alone. I don't believe that. And I don't think you do either. You're our leader, Makama. You're my leader. We've got a job to do. I think it's his best work. I just wish Oniwa was here instead of Matau, given how much he dunked on Vakama in the previous film. It was pretty clear at this point that red and green characters sold more than brown ones. Oof. The larger sets were cool, but their combination models were even better. It ended up being the villains of Time Trap, another in-between story in the in-between story. An epilogue to an epilogue, one last hidden chapter of this devastating era. Something to close the first five years of Bionicle, and hint at developments to come in the second half. It's regarded as the best novel by many. To give you an idea how epic this is, there's a being in it that ages everything he touches, and Makuta's response is to summon an army of hundreds of Rakshi that rush the guy and crumble to dust. Just imagine that spectacle in a movie. <sighs> but look, this whole thing was starting to drag. Enough mid-quels within prequels, follow-ups to other follow-ups. It's time to move on and see how Tao and the gang are doing in the present. The people return to Metro Nui, the city's all cleaned up, and they go back to their old lives. This seems like a decent place for Bionicle to end, doesn't it? Everything turned out pretty okay. Except, not only was Matanui still asleep, he was dying. And if he dies, everyone dies. One character sees it happen in a future vision, and the text describes it in such grueling detail, it still shakes me. So yeah, the stakes have never been higher. Only the Mask of Life, the most powerful of all masks, could save the Great Spirit now. And they had weeks, maybe days, to find and use the thing. So the Toa Nuva went to retrieve it, and they got wrecked. Say hello to the bad boys of 2006, the Paraka. Paraka, the tricker, tracer, drifter, the snake, the beast, the bully, all that makes Paraka. Hey, how you doing, little mama? Let me whisper in your ear. Yeah, this is hilarious. When I saw the comic teaser saying, you won't be leaving, ever, and early images of them with their Guns? Like real actual guns? I cried. I thought Bionicle was turning into something I could no longer recognize or love. 
but it didn't. If anything, it continued the story in an awesome way. It was a subversion of a tale familiar to us. Six canisters wash ashore a mysterious island with a unique design this time. The troubled people gleeful to see their Toa rescuers, but something about these Toa was off. They demanded statues built in their honor and liked to flex their muscles in a mirror. I kind of wish we'd gotten to see the Bionicle 3 that would have been made for this year had our 2005 not happened. Could you imagine these guys on film? With their giant teeth and booming voices and rap music? I pick my teeth with Rakshi. I remember people saying these were the best Bionicle villains since the Rakshi. Not another mindless horde for the Toa to waste, just a few overpowered goons with strength of personality to spare. But the funny thing is, they were a joke to the rest of their species. A dysfunctional collection of no-hoper bums looking for someone smaller to pick on. And they're still stupid tough! It took another team of Toa supercharged by a star to even the odds, and the way they handled this was also pretty smart. This time, these Toa and Nika were some of the Matoran we'd known since 2001. I love that continuity, and the Anika were pretty sweet figures. The colors, the weapons, their body design. People went crazy for them at first. The masks were weird and rubbery, and we were once again getting the same figure six times, though there was some added variation in the armor, feet, and arms, but we'll be getting back to the flaws of the Anika build later. The Titans from this year are probably the most iconic in the whole line. Vizan, the seventh Paraka, made a wild anti-Takanuva type, and his steed was already pretty insane, but combining it with others made a gargantuan final boss for the year. I love it when they work these into the story. Axon and Brutaka, with their complementary colors, weapons, and builds are just great characters designs, and their own connection to the Great Spirit added more depth to the story. In fact, this whole world was starting to get weird. Voyanui was another island on the surface like Matanui, but Metanui and some other places between the two islands were inside giant caves with fake skies. The Matoran of this year were broken, some remembering the time before time, when all Matoran lived in darkness and toiled away until their bodies were no good anymore, not knowing what they were building, not knowing anything else. We found out the Toa canisters from 2001 did not fall from the sky, and that you could just build them. As we'd learn next year, the red star that created these new Toa was a space station with people on it. There were even murmurings of great beings, whatever those were, as if there could be a higher power than the sleeping god of this universe. What did it all mean? I'm sure it'll come up again. Let's watch the Toa I use the power of rock to defeat the Paraka's rap music. <laughs> Two thousand six was another huge year, probably the biggest yet, and that was all without a movie. The whole year was one giant spectacle after another, from scenes like Brutaka knocking out the Toa Nuva with a single swipe of his sword, to the villagers assuming the Toa Nuva were imposters like the Paraka and almost killing them, to the Paraka rounding up all the villagers and just shooting and shooting and shooting them. <laughs> Those mind control balls had something else going on. The vat they're made from screaming as Axon destroys it. Jeez, this year was intense. After the strong but admittedly dragged out Metronui arc, this year was a breath of fresh air. But there was no time to stay. Our new heroes followed the mask of life underwater with only hours to go before the great spirit died, and our old heroes were needed in parts unknown. Before I go any further, I gotta mention the Bionicle playsets, which mixed it with System. These builds aren't that great. They're okay, but I really can't think of much to say about them. I think the later ones were a little better, but that's not saying much. The first minifigures were like player pieces from a board game. 2006s were decent representations of the characters, but then they just stopped trying and mixed everybody's colors and heads up. I'm sorry if anyone's disappointed because they wanted me to talk about this more. I just don't know where to go with this. It was an attempt to appeal to people who didn't like Bionicle. And I think there was a wasted effort that could have gone to developing other things. But if they were a successful gateway for kids and older people who never would have appreciated Bionicle otherwise, then alright, they're okay, they did their job. This one's the best, though. We also got a lot of projectile launchers, oh boy. Some of them I really like, even if just in terms of looks, but the pressure of constantly releasing new ones left us plenty of duds. I just don't like to see an entire team brandishing the same guns anyway. A couple of them, okay. I mean, if a guy came at me with a heavy pair of six-barreled rocket launchers, I better hope he's asking for directions. Now look, I've been finding things to love in every single year so far, and 2006 was pretty big. But I'm not exaggerating when I say that 2007 may just be the most epic year in the entire franchise.
Welcome to the pit, the darkest, dankest, dreariest, most oppressive environment we ever saw. Where only the worst blasphemers are sent for their crimes against God. Where the water irreversibly mutates you to not survive on land without some kind of reverse hazmat. Where the enemies this time are some of the most ancient, strongest warriors ever created, whose rebellion once brought the great spirit to his knees and inspired Makuta's own coup. It's basically mature in hell. We learned so much about the world we never wanted to, and I can't stress enough just how bleak this year was. It felt like the Bionicle equivalent of a disaster flick, a suicidal plunge to rock bottom with the whole world about to end. Just the way they opened this year. My teen self could see that all bets were off. To go over the sets, the Matoran were probably my favorite design out of all the years, and the villainous Baraki blew the whole community away. For several years now, the sets had grown so homogenized and repetitive, but these ghoulish lords of the sea were each very different. It was a diversity we'd never seen before. It was the first time in ages I wanted to collect a whole wave of bunkles and not just one or two of them. I remember people freaking out when I got this one. Lego can tell us all they want that this is his natural color, but come on. We all know what that is on his face, get a bib. The real freaky thing was seeing them commence sea life. Not just part machine bionicle animals, but mostly normal squids and sharks and eels like ours, implying that these were the natural creatures of this ocean planet and the Matoran were not. The veil is slowly lifting. The toe returned with a decent variety of bills as well. I really like Matara's hunched blades and skull-like mask giving him his own Grim Reaper vibe, and Jala's design is one of the best balanced I've ever seen in terms of color placement, proportions, and flow. The toe of water was naturally the poster child for this year, and her build is appropriately very aqua-dynamic, but she was infamous for her brittle bones, a sign of things to come. Man, look at this poster. Seven years in and they still knew how to make Bionicle stylish. Don't get me started on the Titans, we got a boatload of them this time and even these have impressive variety. Freaking look at this guy's teeth! The odds had never been stacked this badly. It really was the Toa's most daunting trial of all, pushing them to do things they normally find unspeakable, especially Mataro. Poor Mataro was another gem of a character, like Takanuva, another humble but committed soul who didn't think much of himself but would do anything to save his friends, to save their universe, even if it meant he could never forgive himself. He knew the truth about Metronui the whole time, always having to lie and keep secrets and feel removed from his brethren, and he gets this really nice moment of validation from Jala towards the end, who doesn't care what Mataro's done, just trust that it was right. And all the while, as if in on the joke, Makuta just sits back and laughs at him. Yeah, Makuta's back in the story too. He's not even the villain of this year, he's just biding his time. I remember being so shocked that he was back. I thought he was dead since 2003, I remember thinking, what the heck is he doing here? Turns out the last year's mind control stuff was just Makuta's essence in a can. Everything was so uncertain, had this air of desperation. Of course, now as fans know what happens next. But at the time, in 2007, it was impossible to see where the story was going, and I spent the whole year on the edge of my seat. And then, the worst came to pass. The Toa failed. The Great Spirit died. The Matoran universe began destroying itself. But the Toa refused to let this be. Jala and the others stayed to buy Mataro a few seconds, knowing they would certainly die against the Baraki's armies. Mataro raced to the center of this universe, a place we still didn't truly understand, and made the ultimate sacrifice, bonding with a mask, his body and soul turning into energy, and the Great Spirit's heart started beating again. With his last conscious thought, Mataro whisked his friends to safety and healed them. Mech and Metanui, they licked their wounds and celebrated the greatest of heroes. I am not kidding, people still cry over Mataro's death, especially those of us who've known him since the beginning. For some like myself, this is where Bionicle peaked. It would never be this good again. I'm surprised 2007 isn't considered more iconic, but they'd done it. They'd saved their world from apocalypse. Our heroes finally got a win, but there was still work to be done. And while the new Toa completed their mission, our old friends the Toa Nuva made preparations in other lands necessary for Matanui's awakening, taming volcanoes that raged for millennia, overthrowing despots with their own pitiful agendas, releasing the Borok swarms to complete their task now that they couldn't hurt anyone. Also, Borok are made from a Torin, and it's as horrific as it sounds. They really are brothers. A final war was brewing between Makuta's allies, the Great Spirit's allies, and every self-important wannabe tyrant vying for power whose chance had come. And with powerful new adaptive armor that enabled them to fly, the gang that started it all for us was headed to the world that fed all worlds, Cardanui. This year, we would finally learn the truth about this whole thing. 
for better or worse. So, the Paraka were powerful, but they were meatheads. The Baraki were proper masters of war who nearly took over the world and were sent to hell for it. These were heavy hitters. Even the Rakshi, once so feared, were now basically another horde like the others. How the heck were they supposed to top recent villains with six or seven new randos? What other races were there to pull from? What could feel like a legit threat this late in the game? Well, just make everyone a Makuta, and they're all at least around as strong as the one we know. That evil hand thingy? They all do that. Most of this time, we thought there was only one Makuta, but there was a whole species of them. And they used to be cyborgs like the Toa, but gave up their flesh to become a gaseous form in shape-shifting armor. Even with their new armor, the Toa were totally outmatched this time. The one advantage they had was when Mataro fell down there and made a sacrifice, some of the Makuta trying to steal the mask from him were blinded by the resulting flash. They needed Matoran helpers just to see. Matoran of light, like Takanuva was apparently, were being rounded up, drained of their light, and turned into Shadow Matoran. The stage was set. Everyone was scrambling for the Mask of Life, all according to Makuta Terridax's design. Yeah, that's his name. I'm just gonna call him Terry. I still can't decide if I like all this or not, but I like the sets. This time they mixed it up. Instead of separating each team's release by six months, they released three Toa and three Makuta together to keep the battle going. The first wave is a strong start. For most of Bionicle's lifespan, we'd been getting sets in the darker Metru colors, which were cool at first, but we kind of wanted a break from that. While I normally wouldn't like this much gray, I think there's just enough of each Toa's brighter signature color that they complement each other. While having this elite I'm ready for war look, Lewis got a lovely bright green and Bronto's orange now because brown characters don't sell. They'd been making formerly brown characters in any other colors they could those last couple years, even yellow. The jetpacks, wings, and rotors gave each Toa a unique feel, and if you look closely enough, you could see the similarities with their old masks. I said I'd frown on them basically making other characters and calling them the old Toa in 2004, but it was 2008, and the oldies hadn't touched store shelves since 2003. I could accept the changes. The bat-like Makuta were sick. The coolest thing was these guys wore masks just like the Toa. Only while Toa had more superhero-like powers, strength, speed, x-ray vision, the Makuta used powers considered deeply immoral, like making people deaf or mute, or sucking the life out of them, or making their own powers go haywire and kill them. Masks most Toa wouldn't be caught dead wearing. This is such an underutilized concept. All while this was going on, Makuta Terry was nowhere to be seen. He ditched his last body. What a critical time for a no-show. But this was all part of his plan, you see. The other three Toa and Makuta weren't quite as solid. The Mystica wave, or Mysteka, as some would call it, just fell apart. These Makuta were more insect-like, in their case mutated by water leaking from the pit of the ceiling, pooling at the bottom to form a cesspool of evil. Krika was a cool design that got away with the scrawny limbs. Probably the most ghoulish bionicle design ever. Fluids visible through a skeletal frame. But the other two are garbage. It also didn't help that by this time, the old curved bones were phased out, and the new ones, while having slightly more friction, were extremely brittle and would often snap if you use them more than once, if even that. For anything made by LEGO, something meant to be reused, that's just inexcusable. And while the first three Toa channeled some of their original character if you squinted, these three are unrecognizable. You could call them anybody and I just shrug. Just inappropriate for what's being marketed as a theme coming full circle, the final battle. Takanuva's return was pretty authentic though. It's clearly him with a heck of a growth spurt. He got infected by the Makuta, but stopped just before it could corrupt him completely. So now he's a Toa with light and shadow powers. I like to imagine him channeling one with each hand. And tired of being tossed around like a hot potato, even the Mask of Life decided to conjure a body and call itself a Toa for a while. That's right, I'm a strong independent mask that don't need no face. And don't even get me started on the vehicles. Those were amazing and huge. With the demise of Gears, the figure straight away from the Technic roots, but these monstrosities of pure Technic engineering were welcome. We also got some the next year. I can't tell you how fun it was to see to figure in one of these and just take off. And it's at this point I can't skirt around the lore anymore, so bear with me. In the previous year, Makuta said that as the universe plunges into chaos, if a time comes when all is in discord, everyone's fighting, the mask will change from gold to silver to black and abort the Bionicle universe. Drain everyone's life force, pull the plug, shut it all down, fade to black. And what do we see here? The masks turn silver. Keep in mind the myriad side stories running at this time where, yeah, all over the Bionicle world, things were breaking down. I sincerely thought things would end with a mask having a panic attack or something, and our heroes and villains bending together to stop it from mercy killing everybody. Things didn't go that way though. After investing eight years of our lives into keeping up with this story, it was time to see the man behind the curtain. The crazy thing, Looking at this from a geological perspective, some people figured out the truth a few months early. The big secret of this 
world. The islands from those last couple years, the pit, those were pieces of the great spirit's stomach. Kardanui was his heart. Metranui was his brain. The two suns in its sky were his eyes. And the island named after him was a mask. I can't think of many things this big. Maybe in scale, but not ideas. The Great Spirit was a giant robot, crashed on this world, his automated camouflage kicking in, creating the island to hide his face even as he slept. Other locations like Metronui, contained in spherical chambers that adjusted gravity to keep things stable. A world within a world. The Matoran, Toa, Borok, and all? Nanomachines. His cells. The temple from the beginning? A simple maintenance hatch. The Matoran tongue? A programming language. Code. Makuta's curse? A computer virus. The sleep? A critical system failure. This thing was 40 million feet tall. An object that big touching down would sterilize Earth. The lighting really makes this scene for me. Parts of him moving hundreds of miles away from us in seconds. All the moisture in the air making him hard to see because he's so far away. Chunks of continental shelf and were from the size of Maine to Texas sliding off his body, falling so slowly. Matanui, the great spirit robot, was built on a world destroyed by war. His mission? Travel the universe and study other worlds, their burgeoning cultures, learn how to avoid the conflicts that tore the old world apart, and when he was ready, rebuild the old world. Good as new. On his way back, he succumbed to Makuta's virus and landed on this fragment of the old world, Aquamagna. Yep, my old username. And this wasn't pulled out of nowhere. This was planned from the beginning, originally set to be revealed in the first year. There were so many hints throughout the story, right under our noses. They were rubbing it in our faces the whole time. Even in 2001, you had miners digging this incredible shaft and at the bottom hitting a layer they couldn't break through. Described as partly organic, a mineral composition similar to a crab shell. We were gazing upon his face, touching his skin. Makuta's lair, the Borok nests, every time the Toa went underground, they were inside the giant robot. And this is where the name finally makes sense. Biological Chronicle. It was all about a body that was sick and needed to be saved from within. Inspired when Christian Faber, the magnanimous art director behind so much of this amazing imagery, required daily medication for a brain tumor and thought, what if inside each pill was a tiny soldier? I know I keep saying this, but I can't adequately express what a mind blow this was, and how cathartic it was to finally see the big guy wake up. All the fighting, all the doom and gloom, it, it didn't matter anymore. After eight long years, our heroes had finally done it. And just like that, Makuta won. See, for the few minutes the Great Spirit was dead, that gave Makuta an opening to jump into his brain and take control of the robot. Terry was the brain tumor. He never wanted to stop our heroes from waking up the robot. He needed them to succeed, and now they'd given him everything he wanted. In retrospect, this makes the first movie an oddity. Rin as if the Toa Nuva story ended there. Dialogue like, Matanui will be awakened this day! And it could have written very differently than in later stories. A lot of this was retconned as the characters toying with each other. Makuta just BSing his way through. But that clearly wasn't the original intent. And I admit, Makuta is much cheesier in later stories. He wasn't so overbearingly childishly evil at first. He he came off as being burdened with a knowable power and knowledge, detached in his own little world. For if you knew the things he does, you'd be cynical too. Maybe taking over the robot wasn't always the plan, but too late for that now. Makuta was the universe. His mug appeared in the stars of Metronui's artificial sky. His voice boomed everywhere. He controlled everything about the Matoran surroundings. There was nowhere they could hide. But not all was lost. It never was. It would take him some time to get used to this new body, like your eyes adjusting to the dark. And despite all the marketing saying this year was the final battle, that battle was just beginning. Somehow, some way, the Toa, Matoran, and anyone else who wanted in would resist and take down Makuta from inside. Matanui's immune system kicked into overdrive against itself. But 2009 wouldn't be about that. 
Not primarily. We'd still see what Tahu, Takanuva, and the rest were up to in serials, but not the toys. Bionicle is a toy line, not a soap opera, and it needs kids to buy it to survive. But a lot of kids weren't because so much lore had piled up by then that they couldn't get into it. It was daunting. They hadn't been there for much of those eight years, and everything that could potentially be alienating about Bionicle was. And Lego knew what they signed up for. They committed to this thing as long as they could. But they were ready to shift gears, at least for a while. Tell a different story. A fresh play to get new kids hooked and be a gateway into old lore. But it's largely because of this that many fans couldn't stand 2008's ending. Really? Gonna slap us with a cliffhanger like that? They couldn't just wake up the great spirit and have a happy ending? Had to tease us with don't worry, they'll win someday to keep our attention as the mask with Matanui's spirit in it is yeeted into space? <laughs> yeah, sure. But me? I didn't mind much. I held out and kept an open mind about where we were headed. These creators, these artists, writers, musicians, designers, had given us years of greatness. It got a little crazy at the end, but they'd given us one heck of a journey. Built up this huge world filled with iconic characters, a once-in-a-lifetime adventure. And now, they would do it all again on another planet. Welcome to Barra Magna, the beginning of the end. I remember people thinking this teaser with Mataro's model meant he'd been reborn on another world. It's a placeholder, but that actually would make a cool story. A metaphor for the afterlife. The world we got took some getting used to. Instead of nubs, the new figures had proper fists with molded fingers. This left fewer connections to hold things. There were women in every tribe, and water-themed characters were no longer exclusively female. They still didn't release any girl characters for those other tribes. We were getting a whole new world of possibilities, a big populace sandbox filled with the tools we needed to start our own stories, just like 2001. They killed it in a year. I saw the leaks in 2008. I think it was August? We were spoiled. And right away, I could tell even from the blurriest images that something was different. These were the most colorful figures in years, very little gray or silver. They even brought back old colors like tan and red and blue. But on top of that, they managed to do something no previous Bionicle figures had. They actually looked like their professed element. Oh sure, Tahu had warm colors and a fiery sword, but Malam cranked up the heat, flames erupting from his body. Strax seemed to have ice growing out of him like crystals. Gresh was thorny like a plant, Kina had fish like fins, Stronius was rough and rocky. It helped that their helmets, yet yeah, helmets this time, not masks, usually matched the texture and shape of their other gear, making each character more cohesive, distinct, and elemental than any Toa we'd ever seen. So of course they didn't have powers. Yet yeah, hilariously, the most elemental group of characters ever had no elemental ability to speak of. These Glatorian and their pint-sized Agori counterparts were in fact much weaker than the Toa and Matoran we were used to traveling with. They're very human-like, born flesh and blood, but enhanced over the ages with cyborg upgrades prosthetics, organ replacements, metal bones, basically the total reverse of Toa biology. This was not conveyed through the toys, just as skeletal and riddled with pistons as ever. Things like this make it evident there was some disconnect between the toy designers and the story team. Barra Magna, once a chunk of the same planet Aqua Magna exploded from, inherited the old world's deserts. Oh sure, there were spots here and there that were livable, the occasional thicket or oasis, but this was a brutally harsh Mad Max-like world with very limited resources. To stop themselves from wiping each other out, the clans agreed to settle their disputes in the arena. Villagers would hire Glatorian to represent them, who'd then get a cut of the spoils. And what a fascinating lineup of new characters. Up until now, every wave aside from 2008 was self-contained. A uniform team of six heroes, or six villains. But this time, four out of the first six characters ranged from ambivalent or neutral to downright murderous. Only Terex and Gresh could really be called good guys, and it shouldn't surprise anyone that Gresh has become quite popular. In this cruel world, he was the golden boy, an arrow flint sword who loved a good clean fight, didn't lose his temper in the ring, and didn't need to be paid to help people out. When you're in trouble, he'll make the save cause he's got his pride, dang it. Grish is great. Life on Barra Magna would only get harder as the rock tribe all named Skrull save its most noteworthy members started cleaning house. They were a different cast altogether, much stronger than most Glatorian, and won every single match until they decided to just destroy the arena and declare war on all the other tribes. Once again, the stage was set, and then Matanui landed on the planet. Yep, just dropped in the middle of all these other people's story, made himself a body, and solved everything in the fourth Bionicle movie, The Legend Reborn. Which is okay, I like some of the dialogue, but the action's weak, the pacing's off, the environments are... I don't know. And they picked now of all times to make the character models toy accurate, so these organic, human-like beings look even more robotic than the Toa did. Now, I like the idea of Matanui, this disgraced former god reduced to us, a being who until now paid little mind to the squabbles of the nanomachines inside 
beside him, finally learning to appreciate the small things in life, befriending a bug. I also love the idea of a car, an aged warrior who knows every trick in the book but lost the people's hearts and minds, ready to retire until this alien stranger, a being of cosmic importance, appreciates his guidance and gives him purpose. What a fascinating relationship to explore. And they didn't go anywhere with it. And as great as a duel with a rock tribe's leader could have been, it's lame. Really, this should be the most epic duel in the series. You have this godlike being fighting for his life after losing everything, traveling across the stars to face the toughest best smelt head on the planet, two worlds on the line. Eh, just hit his back three times like it's a video game. Matanui even starts handing out elemental powers to his friends, calling them Toa. Most of these are obvious enough, fire, water, but why do you make Gresha Toa there? Is it because he's green? He's part of the jungle tribe, shouldn't he be a Toa of plant life? Those are a thing. It's kind of astounding how eager they were to course correct. What they established in a single year is no small feat. They put all this energy into developing a bold new world, a rich chapter in the Bionicle saga, and they couldn't commit to it. And again, it's not like they completely abandoned the old cast, their story continued in the text. And as much as I miss getting toys of them, I respected this soft reboot. I was really engrossed in the setting, but just as things were coming together, they wrapped it up as quickly as they could. And then they did it again in 2010. A whole roadmap of future stories were planned. Matanui go into a forest world to fight giant cyborg dinosaurs. An entire year would have taken place aboard the Red Star. This story was going places. It got cancelled. Sales continuing to decline year to year, as more people outgrew the toys and the story failed to bring in new fans, Lego put Bionicle to bed. Just like that. But some people on the team protested and managed to convince LEGO to release one more line of figures, a little something for everyone to love, if only to give us closure. The story that played out from here was heavily abridged. Matanui realized that the giant structures strewn across the planet's surface that the Baramagnans used for shelter were actually parts of a giant robot body similar to his old one, a prototype body that malfunctioned and exploded on the old world, but could be rebuilt with the people's help. At the other end of the solar system, Makuta was just beginning to feel at home in his brother's old skin, and he'd conquered a a universe of sorts, sure, but why stop there? It was time to expand this operation, start stepping on other innocent planets. Just had to take care of one thing first, Matanui was still out there. Makuta could feel the Great Spirit's power growing and rocketed toward the desert to finish him off. And so unfolded the most titanic round of Rock'em Sock'em robots you could ask for. People on the ground panicked, the sky was falling, the world was ending. Armies of Rakshi and Skakti flooded out of Makuta's feet and joined the Skrull and- Wait, what's this? Why do they look- why is Grish so short? Oh no. Behold the Bionicle Stars. I think these figures speak for themselves. They're Matoran and Nagori with slightly more armor. I never liked this building style much. It's even more hyper-specific than Bionicle usually is. I don't mind the new stature of the villains so much, those are mostly troops. But this is supposed to be Nektan, the most powerful Skakti of all, marketed as Tahu's rival in this final wave. I like Takanuva's silver sheen, it's like he's been purified. But uh... Tahu reverted from his mutated Nuva form to his original body. Sure. And Gresh is short. Don't know how many surgeries were required to pull that off, he just is now. It was nice of them to pull a bit from almost every era Bionicle for this line, and it's as colorful a bunch as ever. It's nice to see Tahu looking like Tahu again, but the limited posability and extremely simplistic builds weren't the best note to end on. Each figure came with a golden piece of armor, and so one last fetch quest ensued on the ground while the real battle waged above. This armor was conveniently designed to obliterate Makuta constructs like Rakshi. It also gave the wearer the powers of any destroyed. Assuming there were Rakshi of all kinds present and not just these yellow ones, Tahu just gained all of the superpowers you can think of. The ensuing wave of destruction thinned the enemy's numbers generously, and like a disturbance in the force, the shock of Tahu vaporizing all his children shook Makuta's resolve, giving Matanui an opening. All things considered, Matanui had held his own pretty well, careful not to damage the planet's surface, but even more careful not to actually hit Makuta, lest he kill the Matoran still inside. Rather fortuitously, a fragment of Aqua Magna had followed Makuta all the way here. Scrunching up the last of his strength, Matanui shoved his own head in the path of a meteor and brained Makuta. Yeah, killed him just like that. Makuta fell, and all our beloved characters migrated out of the only home they ever knew. With what life force he had left, Matanui fulfilled the function he was designed for, bringing the three worlds together at last. Everyone expected to die as the planets collided, but miraculously the old world, Spherius Magna, with all its forests and oceans, was restored. And with some parting words of his own and a heartfelt speech from Tahu, Matanui departed this world, wanting our heroes to learn to survive and thrive without him. This was... pretty sweet. Not the ending we were supposed to get, 
but it was something. It gave us the closure we didn't get in 2008. Makuta was gone, and the Toen Matoran, once mere cells with no other options in life, created to keep the giant robot working, were free at last. They could live lives of their own, in a new Eden, but just because no more toys were on the way didn't mean their troubles were over. For a while, Greg Farshti continued writing the serials, and the Bionicle section of LEGO.com stayed up a couple years, and in that time, we saw our characters adjust. We saw the human-like Latorian and Agori forced to share their world with these aliens that looked and in some ways acted very robotic, with their computer lens eyes that still blinked for some reason. New villages were built, a new culture was forming, but there were still many enemies at large, like the Element Lords, basically the Great Being's first attempt at creating Toa. There were prototype Borok, built to end wars by slaying anyone carrying a weapon. These Great Beings left a bunch of stuff laying around that's more trouble than it's worth. A few of these Great Beings were still around, and had their own new designs for for our heroes. Some of them did not approve the Toa and Mator and these ants they built having free will and try to settle down and act like people? <laughs> I mean, the gall of these things. I called those characters nanobots, but that's the exact choice of words these creeps used. Tahu, Takanuva, all the rest, they were supposed to be shut down along with the robot once the planet was healed. They're still around? That's dangerous. There was still so much we wanted to know, where all our favorite characters wound up on the new planet, who'd live, who'd die, but Greg was a busy man. He had a growing family to feed, and numerous books he was still writing for Lego. Ninjago, Hero Factory, you name it. And so, like all good things, the serials too ended. In time, Greg would give us some idea of how the story would have continued, and some things we may have been better off not knowing. In this strange time, we learned that Velika, a random Matoran from 2006 who talked funny and liked riddles, was in fact a great being in Skies, who transferred his mind into a Matoran body, hopped aboard the great spirit robot, gave his denizens their soul just to watch the ensuing chaos play out, and was secretly in contact with his agents on Barra Magna the whole time. <laughs> Why not? The last few serials built Velika up to be the new villain, killing off the most powerful players left and right, pushing everyone towards an all-out war. This world would have nearly been destroyed a second time. Takanuva would have fulfilled his true destiny by stopping the fighting. Maybe calm everyone down with a wave of light that turns him into a Taraga or something, I don't know. It would probably happen right about now if the line was still going. Then we learn the Great Being's true nature. I had long assumed they were a third party, a mysterious race of interstellar travelers who'd settled on the old world and shared their technology with the primitive locals. Nope, turned out they were just a few renegade Glatorian. These were the great beings. They designed the Matoran, of course Takua was the first, and the Toa, the great spirit robot, they built it all. And any magic that Bionicle still had fizzled out. We learned that lacking the ability to reproduce, the Matoran didn't know emotions like love. That's a big ol' middle digit to ace people. Every no-name Elister was revealed to be a sleeper agent or a secret god or whatever, nothing surprised us anymore. People started bringing back Bionicle campaigns, the fanbase was in freefall. It was not a good time to be a Bionicle fan. Heck, I started my own continuation that picks up thousands of years later on a new planet just to fill the void. Many wanted to go back to a simpler time, when it was just a few cute robots on a tropical island, and half of these characters weren't lost in space or secretly evil the whole time. But then, the leaks started up again, and they soon got their wish at San Diego Comic-Con. In 2014, Bionicle Generation 2 was revealed. Tahu, Gally, and company were back, and cancelled again two years later. Where do we start? I think I appreciate Bionicle G2 more than most people, if my long rambly reviews from those years don't give that away. The biggest thing that turned off some fans was the character creature building system, which we went over in the Hero Factory episode, and was made to be the action figure version of Lego Bricks, something comprehensive and endlessly reusable, but very basic. People wanted all the old pieces back, but that just wasn't doable. A few of the old molds survived, but most of the machines were junked, buried. It would cost a fortune to bring those pieces out of retirement, but more to the point, they wanted Bionicle to have a system, which it hadn't before now. In early years, each new wave was its own specific thing. When Borok or Rakshi or Toa Metru came out, you weren't getting six new figures. You were getting one new figure in six colors, which made collecting easy since you'd pick one or two in your favorite colors and stop. Your first time building a Toa Metro or Borok is special. Every line was unique and fresh. But the fifth or sixth or twelfth time around, it's stale, and designing an entire new 
aesthetic each year, leaving out most of the older parts was expensive in itself. And it's just not how LEGO does things in normal lines. The Toa and Nika were the last time they completely reinvented Bionicle like this, and for the next few years they tried to give Bionicle a more permanent system around the Anika build. It was a disaster. Some figures like the Baraki showed great variety, and even in the final waves they tried to retain some variation in body type, but most of these figures just look the same. As much as I like some Glatorian, most of the budget for new parts went into their shoulder pads. Over and over, another Anika build with some negligible flourish. I remember almost every review from this era on sites like BZP pointing this out constantly, how annoying and repetitive Bionicle became. If you built one of these before, you could build a new one without instructions. And each year, prices just shot higher and higher while the figures didn't change. It needed to be reinvented top to bottom. So while Bionicle was in sleep mode, they developed CCBS, added to it with various add-ons and adapters. And when it was ready, we got this. It's a mixed bag. The builds are more complex than ever, combining CCBS with pure Technic, bringing back gear functions from the days of old, masks that can be knocked off, and each Toa has a more unique silhouette than ever before. It wasn't just set design, it was character design, right down to color choices telling us how they fight, how they move, even what they're wearing. Vibrant blues, greens, and browns, transcolored elements, the contrasting inner skeleton really popped. The smoothness, while not typical of Bionicle, gave these a more mythical quality, like they'd been carved from marble and breathed to life. The masks were nicely updated, the weapons had great extra uses like older tools, and with a golden mask and facehugger-like skull spiders, a great evolution of the concept. These were packed. They did have problems, though. The arms hanging back because the spine wasn't made for this, something Star Wars figures fixed that I've since incorporated into my Toa. The higher-than-ever piece counts made these less accessible and affordable than the likes of the original Toa. And don't get me started on how lukewarm the villains were. As much as I like the idea of metal skeletons twisted into horrid inhuman shapes, the goal with G2 was to streamline the story, boil Bionicle down to his base elements that worked so well in 2001, to keep it simple, stupid. And this really was necessary. You can't expect the average parent to find a Toa Fantoka Mystica Pohate Nuva Christmas shopping at Target. You just can't. So they simplify the terminology. Toa were called Masters or Uniters most of the time. The Taraga surrogates called Protectors. It starts out familiar enough. Two brothers, a mystical island, an advanced city, one goes nuts with power, the good ones put to sleep, the villagers summon the Toa to save them. We've been here before. The Toa's journey was communicated through animated shorts made to be easily watchable on smart devices. There were some changes to their personalities I liked and some I didn't. Funnily enough, they're all voiced by one guy, and I distinctly remember confused people going, WTF? Why is Gally sound like a man? Because they weren't familiar with the concept of a narrator. But this simplicity fell apart as the lore quickly piled up again and became a disjointed web of plot holes, retcons, and conflicting information, leaving it vague whether these were the original Toa reincarnated or pulled from another timeline or what. Characters having visions that contradict each other. Worst of all was their mentor, Akimu, essentially reading the script ahead of time and leading our heroes to their doom because he already knows everything they're going to do. I wish the writers saw that script. It comes off like most of them didn't have a story bible to stick to. Complicated as Jiwen's jargon was, it was mostly consistent. It felt like most of the writers were on the same page. But all the problems of older Bionicle media were needlessly exacerbated here, and it didn't help that LEGO put barely any capital or effort into advertising this theme, expecting older fans to do the work for them and tell all the kids how awesome Bionicle was in the time before time, whatever that means. Means. It had a smaller online presence and weaker marketing than G1. Lego just expected it to sell and didn't follow through. It was a perfect storm of the stars not aligning, the exact opposite of the original's excellent launch, and the next wave of Toa would be the last we'd ever see. I like these Toa maybe even more, but they had their own issues, all built around a new torso that worked well but made some wonky proportions with short stumpy limbs, and I actually prefer Anua being broad and chunky. But I love the even more diverse colors, the increasing focus on Technic, and more backwards compatible old school looking pieces. What's amazing is these were fairly generic parts that could be used in many different ways. So while you had most of these Toa sharing the same crystalline blades, shields, etc., they don't all look the same. It gave them that stylistic cohesion between sets that you expect from LEGO in general, while still feeling like individuals. While the first wave admittedly felt half-baked, these were a big step towards recapturing that old Bionicle charm. I especially like seeing a bigger emphasis on each Toa his own transparent color. Feels ethereal, like chunks of their bodies are made of the elements. Their new masks are some of my favorites, and the Rahi-like animals add even more splendor. I've since modified these sets, uh, slightly. Not because I don't already like them, it's just something I do with all my LEGO sets, taking a scalpel to them until they're perfect in my mind. They even released a more proper miniseries on Netflix that was 
eh, alright, but it really fell apart at the end. Decent animation. But all these strides in the right direction were too late. The last set's a few more underwhelming villains. Yeah, we've covered numerous lines that lost steam and ended after two and a half years, but this didn't even make it that far. If you want to hear my further thoughts on this whole debacle, I'll link this video in the description. I threw it together within days of the cancellation. To summarize, LEGO dropped the ball. Cancelling Bionicle the first time was actually really smart, because the sales were still just good enough that retailers wouldn't be reluctant to carry them again. Can't say that now. While LEGO's insisted G2 sold well, if it did, they wouldn't have cancelled it so quickly. They wasted money on contest prizes like masks made of actual gold that could have gone towards other forms of advertising. But now Bionicle's so deep in the hole they might never revive it again. But it does make me wonder a bit. Is Bionicle an aberration, a fluke that under normal circumstances, by all rights, wouldn't have a chance? Could it only survive in a time when LEGO's other products weren't very good and kids were desperate? It's enough to make a Biofan feel gaslighted. I don't want to be bitter, but it really isn't cool how some people in the LEGO community talk about this theme, or people like me. And I'm not just saying they should respect Bionicle for saving LEGO from bankruptcy, although it did. There's this boomer-like dismissal of Bionicle fans not knowing better, as just not seeing the clear merits of normal system. There's a stereotype of a LEGO buyer's dark age, not the kind where they lose interest in LEGO as a whole, but may as well led astray by these not real LEGO and eventually come into their senses like, what was I thinking, bonkles? Thank goodness I've remembered how much better system is. Bricks are all I need. And as someone who's grown up both a connoisseur of bricks and Bionicle, I find that very insulting. Not to mention the gross gatekeeping towards people who, yeah, may only ever have grown up with this and not tried out system yet as inauthentic LEGO fans. Oh, you'll get it someday, Jimmy. You'll see the light and stop wasting time on all that robot junk. I also don't appreciate the sentiment that LEGO shouldn't make action figures because it's not what people come to them for. But for all the promise CCBS had, LEGO barely uses it anymore. At the time I made that other video, construction was still going strong. Now even those Star Wars figures are a distant memory. Clearly, the kids of today, and even most people my age, aren't interested in this sort of thing. Some believe that it's better that way, that the course LEGO's taking now is the correct one. And some days, it's enough to make me wonder. Maybe I am crazy to like these figures. Maybe I'm in denial and Bionicle was illegitimate this whole time. Maybe I am an inauthentic LEGO fan who just doesn't get it. Yeah, no. The Chima figures failed because there were already too many other Chima products at once. The Star Wars figures had to compete with other Star Wars figures by other companies. The kinds that realistically capture the look of those characters. Maybe a little cheaper, and not have so many small pieces to lose. I said back then that kids buy those not for Lego, but for Star Wars. But most of them weren't characters people wanted, they don't make good display pieces, and they weren't providing anything play-wise that you can't get somewhere else. This is reason 941 that I don't much care for most licensed Lego products. They dilute the waters, that's half of their input now. And yeah, it's made them bigger than ever, but do we really need so many placeholder bikes or helicopters in each franchise's skin? It's very different from the wild west of the late 90s and early 2000s, where LEGO had to try a variety of new things and just hope for the best, cross their fingers. They were lucky Bionicle worked, but Bionicle isn't something you can get from Hasbro or Mattel, or anywhere else. Hidden Side isn't, Ninjago isn't, Exoforce isn't, Knight's Kingdom isn't, Adventures isn't, and that's what LEGO really should have focused on, creating a unique new world for kids to get sucked into. Maybe they didn't even need to do it this way. Sure, G2 had a lot of surface level trappings and plot beats of old, but I think Bionicle needs room to grow, to experiment. It's why I respect 2009 so much. It didn't need Tahu or Kopaka or even Matanui to hook me in. I think there's enough material here to be a self-contained reboot, and I wish G2 was more like that. Another world, another story, another cast of characters. I think Bionicle has a potential for many stories that could just share a few similar aesthetics. Colorful cyborgs, elemental abilities, detailed imaginative worlds, but those basics being the only connective tissue. This is why Nova Orbis was important to me and other people in the interim. It wasn't the names or old characters that made it nostalgic for us, it was the sense of discovery, of being welcomed into a world completely alien to us, goaded to explore once again. And isn't that the most fascinating thing? That the real nostalgia of Bionicle isn't the familiar elements, but that sense of newness, that mystery, that ever-present uncertainty of what's around the corner is exciting. And I think that's what G2 solely lacks. It's just a watered-down version of something we already had, that we already know about. And the note it ended on flushed all the possibility for new stories away. Can Bionicle as it was work today? 
I don't know, but I refuse to accept that it can't work in any form. Even if it became a system theme or whatever, people can say it doesn't mean anything then, that it just be Bionicle in name and I'm admitting defeat, but I don't know, I'd feel hypocritical ruling that out after everything I just said about telling different stories with a Bionicle moniker. I hope people who have followed me through this series, even if they never liked Bionicle, can appreciate what they've seen today. That it is valid. Every bit the real, legitimate Lego that everything else we've looked at for three seasons is. One thing I've tried to do with LEGO Rewind is teach people to appreciate the things they have, or had, in a healthy way. And part of that means learning to let go of things while they're still good, while you can still remember them fondly, like LEGO did the first time, and like I'm doing with this series. But an interesting runoff effect has cropped up, something I can only call secondhand nostalgia. I've tried my best to represent the subject matter plainly and untinted, to show what the world was like at the time, the trends, the vibe of each theme, their synergy with other themes in this wider landscape of LEGO, their successes and their beautiful failures, and many adult fans of LEGO who tuned out long ago, or teen fans who just missed out the first time, have told me they find themselves awash with nostalgia for things they've never seen before, that they're just discovering through this show, because they could imagine what it was like to be there because they get it. And I think that's powerful, that this show has had that effect. That's all I ever wanted, to communicate ideas. And daunting as this episode was to produce, I hope I've managed to convey what made Bionicle great for its time and place, what it means to me. I hope that people will be slightly more hesitant to dismiss it as a dark stain on LEGO's history, something so uncharacteristic and strange that we should forget it ever happened. And I hope I've shown that, yeah, you can love all those other LEGO themes, and loving this doesn't undo that. It doesn't mean you have to hand in your card because you're not a real LEGO fan or whatever. As much as G2's drained me, killed my passion for continuing Nova Orbis, I am still glad I have these. Nostalgic as I may be for the Toa, the Nuva, Hakuna Matata, this is a definitive version of these characters in my eyes. And at least for now, they get the top shelf. This is how I like to imagine they ended up on Spherius Magna years after the serials trailed off, that they're gonna be alright. I've also mixed some of my G1 figures with CCBS, giving them that more story-accurate, fleshy look, if only to show that, yes, the old and new molds can coexist as seamlessly as any two LEGO pieces. And I think that speaks to the strength of construction, as a premise. Sure, it's not easy turning these parts into a house or a piece of furniture, although fans will always find a way, but I like being able to customize these figures, on a level far deeper than anything we'll ever see with minifigures, or anything another company would make. I said at the beginning of the season that many of these pieces were designed with one or two specific uses in mind. But while LEGO may not intend for you to find less orthodox rules for them, you absolutely can. Bionicle may have its own built-in limitations, but we're bigger than that. People saying it can't do anything with this, they just haven't tried. I think the vast wealth of mocks made over the years and to this day attest to that. I'm using a lightsaber beam to hold all this together. You can make any character you want, or any version of a character you want with a few of the right parts, and that's how I look at all of LEGO. The build is never really finished. You can always come back to it and make adjustments to your liking as you grow. Make your own story. It can't be overstated just how impressive the bio community's dedication to preserving this titan for future generations of Bionicle fans is, or how profound an impact it left on us. It was that once-in-a-lifetime theme. Well, you know what I mean. We may never see imagery this epic from LEGO again, stories this moody, but that's okay. Just as Matanui wanted his children to build a new life for themselves, it's up to us to keep looking ahead. But if we do want Bionicle to return, the best way is to support projects like these on LEGO Ideas. They actually do a pretty good job of capturing the world's mystique. Apparently this was one of the fastest pitches to hit the required 10,000 mark. That's great. And it's not like Bionicle went anywhere. Not really. Just fairly recently, after the time it takes to raise a child, some fans got that cancelled PC game working. In fact, they're modifying it to improve the gameplay. Now, it'll be better than it would have been if LEGO had released it. It's a dream come true. There's even a reference to it in Hidden Side, which I kinda take as a thumbs up to the community from whoever threw that in. As much as people may tire of it, as much as some may want us to move on completely and stop talking about it, Bionicle is important to LEGO's history, to pop culture. That image of Tahu's mask with a screaming maw and iconic scowl is not going anywhere. And this video is far from the last word on the subject, not necessarily because we can't let it go, but because it never stopped giving. So maybe we don't need a G3, maybe what we have now is enough. But I've been surprised before, 
I guess we'll see how quickly this video becomes out of date. As for me, before YouTube forced my hand and I cranked out the remaining rewinds back to back with no breaks, I was working on the Toa, my own reimagining of the good old days with a twist. What if you only had the first year to tell the entire story, while keeping it simple and easy for newcomers to understand? How do you make a Bionicle story that even people who don't like Bionicle can enjoy? Which parts would you keep? What would you leave out? What's most important? It's about a third of the way done, and so far I've played things pretty straight. But trust me, you have no idea where it's going. I'll get back to work on it soon, and you're gonna see some crazy things as it veers further and further away from the original timeline. And someday after this is over, I do hope to get back into Nova Orbis. I might even do an alternate take on Barra Magna someday, imagining if things happen differently. As for this, what we've done here, it's been fun. We've covered close to 100 themes, at least 90, and there's not much left to see. And if I do keep going, it's gonna stop being fun. I don't think it's the last time you'll ever see a video like this. I plan to do a year in review each December similar to my seasonal recaps showing how things change year to year. And maybe someday, years from now, if there's enough new material, I might make a fourth season. I owe a lot to LEGO Rewind. I've learned to make my scripts more concise, this video notwithstanding, to pack more punch into every line. I've learned a lot about editing and creating an atmosphere to bring people into my world. And I'm gonna carry this quality, this presentation into what I make in 2020. But most of all, I have this series supporters to thank for my channel's recent growth. When I started this show, I think I had around 7,000 subs. It was a combination of earlier episodes and that Alita video I made in 2017 that really got the ball rolling. And in that time, two Decembers later, I've risen over 33,000. Maybe 34 by the time this goes up, almost five times what I used to be. Recently going through my backlog, I found one video where I was just thankful to hit 30,000 views. And I remember the exact sub count I had when my original channel from the old days of YouTube was accidentally deleted by someone I know. 342. At the time, I felt lucky to even have that much of a following. I thought that was the most I'd ever get. But as of this writing, I'm nearly a hundred times that size. And it's all thanks to you. I didn't ask anyone to subscribe, to stick around for more of this. I just uploaded the content. And I can't thank you enough for the support, the feedback, the ongoing conversation we've had these last couple years as this community's grown. Continuing what I said last episode, I'm happy we could have this time together. From people who lost interest in the hobby falling in love with it again, to the occasional LEGO store employee who just appreciates my takes, sharing stories, discovering things we never knew we were looking for, rediscovering things we'd forgotten. I'd say it's been a successful experiment. I don't know what's going to happen to this series in January. I have a good idea. But just in case everything else is affected, I'll do what I can to keep this episode from falling into the dreaded Made for Kids box, so people who stumble on this series weeks, months, or even years from its end will still have a place to reminisce here. We'll just have to see how January goes. It doesn't matter if you followed the series from the beginning, or a few months ago, or a week ago. It doesn't matter if you've been watching me for over 10 years, or you're just discovering this 10 years from now. If you stuck with me through all my ramblings of today, and you're still here, I have something to tell you. You are Lego Rewind. 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 And you are Lego Rewind. You are Lego Rewind. You are Lego Rewind. You are Lego Rewind. Well, you made it this far. Thank you for indulging me as I rambled about old dead Legos for 40 episodes. I don't typically stick to any series for this long. My channel's always been pretty experimental. Lego Rewind is by far the biggest, most comprehensive commitment I've made on this channel. And it could have ended four measly episodes in, back when it was just another shot in the dark. I had no idea it could be taken this far. I want LEGO Rewind to be this special self-contained thing, a time capsule. I want to remember us just like this, and the people who get that, who can appreciate the ephemeral nature of this series, the message, you're awesome. We appreciate things because they're temporary because we're temporary, but it's never too late to appreciate them, and I wanted to at least preserve some of those things so other people can enjoy them for a little while. But if anyone else wants to make their own LEGO retrospective, be my guest. All I ask is that you don't use a LEGO Rewind branding. LEGO Rewind itself is over, as it ought to be. Please respect my wish for the series to end. You can make a similar style, similar format, just have a different intro, your own assets, call it something else and we'll be peachy. Cause whatever you make, no matter how different it is, there's no reason to it shouldn't be as good as what's happened here. Just be sure you know why you want to do it. Because I wasn't even completely sure walking into this, but here we are. 
and I hope you've had half as much fun as I have. My brothers, sisters, and NB siblings, it's been a bash. I'm not going anywhere, my channel's not going anywhere, I'll just have to adapt to change as always. So stick with me and see how things go, won't you? Even if not, even if you've had enough of me and this is the end of our journey together, I'm still glad you came along for the trip. This is the way of the Bionicle. Special thanks to Jang Bricks, Just Too Good, MNR Productions, Brickitect, Brickstar, LJ, Detonaglia Studios, and Maniac for Bricks. I wasn't sure who'd be on board, but everybody came through, and I can't repay them enough. That's it for today. If you want to support my work, please consider my graphic novel series Planet Ripple. You can buy the books on Amazon or read an early draft of the first book for free. Won't be long now before Volume 5 is released. And for the Bionicle fans in my audience, and maybe even non-fans, there's the Toa, my ultimate love letter to the original series, which depending on when you watch this, might be completed. Links to everything in the description. And now, goodbye. Discover their skills. Use their masks. Bionicle. Find the power. Live the legend. Hey guys, today I wanted to try out something new as a side thing to go along with my game reviews. Welcome to Nick on Aquamagnus LEGO Rewind. Despite whatever impressions including Aquamagnus my username might give people, Bionicle is not the only LEGO theme I like, and I felt like showing my appreciation for a few of LEGO's many other themes, the ones that have really clicked with me. Some of these will be themes I collected, while others will be before my time that I later discovered and went to introduce the next generation to. In this episode...